I'm Sam Craven. And I'm Matt Pavlik. Yeah, we're going to do the uh, talking about the stuffs. Yeah. We're going to do the Fate Reforged uh, set review. Yes. So we're going to go over that some stuff. That's what we're going to do. All right, so let's actually get started because uh, we got to like pound through these, uh, All right. these cards here. We're going to go in order of mechanics, but before we go in order of mechanics, let's start out with probably the face of the set, Ugin the Spirit Dragon. I thought you were going to talk about huge stone retainers. No, man. Ugin the Spirit Dragon has to be the first thing that we talk about. It costs eight mana. It has a picture of Ugin on it. I don't think he's too impressive. Well, let me go ahead and read it. Ugin the Spirit Dragon, mana cost eight, Planeswalker Ugin. Comes in with seven loyalty counters, plus two. It deals three damage to target creature or player. Lightning Bolt's not bad. Minus X, exile each permanent with converted mana cost X or less. That's one or more colors. And minus ten, you gain seven life, draw seven cards, and put up to seven permanent cards from your hand onto the battlefield. So let's talk about it. So first, where do you think this is actually going to see play at eight mana? Well, that's the thing. With eight mana, you're talking about Metalworker, Nick Fit. Uh, Cloud Post. Uh, I would imagine one or two of in Modern Tron. Okay, and that's this fair. would maybe take your Karn spot. I think he does because I think he is quite a bit better than Karn. Well, I think the big thing on this is your minus X. You can remove pretty much any card in any format the turn this comes in. Yeah, I mean, basically, what's going to happen is this comes and basically uh, all his dusts the board. Then destroy lands. Okay. Which is well, why it's it's one or more colors, which is an interesting way to phrase that. Sure. Um, point being, you're getting rid of basically everything, and if you're like an artifact-based deck, oh, funny how all your stuff is going to survive. You're also going to be going, uh, if you just go straight for the ticking up, you can ultimate, uh, let's see, play it. It's at 9 the first turn you play it. It's at 11 the second turn. It's three turn. turns yeah, after. It's the third turn. So you bolt them twice, and then you put seven permanents onto the battlefield after drawing seven cards. Yes, if you're at eight, you should win the game already, but now you should really, the game should be over. Like, you should go minus ten, and they can see you. I agree. I think that, I think this will see a lot of play. I mean, I was talking about this with some friends, specifically in Cloud Post, because eight is nothing. Oh yeah, eight's super easy in a Cloud Post deck. And you have a problem with basically clearing out permanents, like... In Cloud Post, you're hoping to, like, naturally play Emrakul after you search it up with Eye of Ugin, you know, take an extra turn, 15, you Karakas it back and do it again. And the main method that, of taking care of business that's on board is what, Repeal? Yeah, Repeal is your only way to do, of doing that. And that costs 15, so it takes you a while to get up to Emrakul. Eight mana in that deck is nothing. I've seen that deck sit around with eight mana, just going like, I just need to draw the gas, and then I'm good to go. Heck, I played against uh, Cloud Post earlier this week where he had more than eight lands on board. Yeah, so I see this uh, seeing some play. Seeing some play, Mostly... not in Tier 1 decks. Well, I agree. Yeah, unfortunately, too, it's too bad that uh, 12 Post is not Tier 1. But it is still a very good deck. Yeah, and it's a pain. Pain to play against. In Nick Fit, having been on the Nick Fit train for the last 6 to 8 weeks, I don't think this will see play. You have no way to tutor it. It's still good, but the collateral damage on this is pretty harsh as well. It isn't out to Jace, which is tough for the uh, the junk builds. Specifically, because red has punishing fires and red elemental blasts, but I still think it's a little bit high on the curve. Prime time is kind of as high as you want to go, and even then, most people don't play prime time anymore. So eight, I think, is a little bit of a stretch. You, it could be a one of. But can you talk a little bit so. more about what you mean by the collateral damage this card creates in a uh, deck like Nick Fit? Oh, you have a bunch of uh, multicolored uh, permanents that you want to have on the battlefield. Certainly. So but my my thought is that being that it's Nick Fit and you're ramping up very quickly. If you, like, minus two or minus three, you're going to get probably their whole board while not getting that many of your games. I guess it depends on where you've kind of advanced to yeah, and, in the particular and game state. if you're state. at eight, you're probably pretty advanced. You've probably resolved a Primeval Titan, really, if you're at eight. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Is like, how are you getting to eight mana? So that's probably on turn six, five or six. So what are you going to have to get rid of on turn five or six? Probably a Jace. Like, if that's your actual... Because this is the only reason you'd kind of play this. Because you have British Deed, basically, for everything else. Yeah. So if you're getting rid... If you're if you're doing it on four, you're basically tanking most of your deck. The only things that are above four are Thrag Tusk or Primetime. And at eight, you're feeling really, really sad if they just counterspell this. Oh, yes, you do. All right, on. I still think that, I still think the card definitely has merit, and it is going to see play. Yeah, I'll be curious what this does in modern. Um, Karn is like over fifty bucks now because of Tron, and oh, well. this does um, a similar but not the same role. I think it does it a little bit better. 
Albeit at a higher mana cost. But I think the exiling from a hand is a big deal, and exiling target permanent instead of sweeping is a big deal. Anyway, on to the next thing. Yeah, so the next thing appears to be we're going to talk about the delve mechanic again. Again. Um, again. The first one on the list is Temporal Trespass. It's eight. Yeah. Blue, blue, blue. That's 11 mana. It has delve, so you can cast this for just triple blue. Take an extra turn after this one, exile Temporal Trespass. So, again, another thing that, well, is this going to be good enough? Well, is Delve 8 that hard? Well, no, not really. I mean, Treasure Cruise is 7, and a lot of people are having no trouble casting that card. So, what about Temporal Trespass? So, 3 blue. So, how much do you want to pay for taking an extra turn? Well, obviously, 2 is real good, as we know. Uh, 5 seems to be about average. I'd pay 4, depending on the format. Three seems three seems pretty good. I, I I think yeah, four and three both seem really good. I think where this becomes really difficult is the triple blue. Yeah, so Delver can't play this card, or probably won't play this yeah, card. If, if I I think people will just card, jam it. It's uh it's playing more basics than most Delver lists that uh that are seeing play today. Yeah. So does Miracles want to play this card? No. Um, I could see it. I don't know. You get so much value off a of Snapcaster Mage, and you have to delve eight. Well, I think I think where you where this is gonna want to see play because especially at eight, you're wrecking your graveyard, which is in a lot of decks gonna mess up a lot of your plan. I think if you're playing this, you're doing it similar to a manner where you would play Time Walk in like a Pyromancer deck or in a Merfolk deck, where your idea here is Temporal Trespass, Untap, Kill you. So the reason I think it has maybe merit in, um, like, you're just saying, is it okay in Miracles? It could be okay if you go Entreat the Angels, Temporal Trespass, Kill you. Yeah, but you could also just go End of yeah, Turn, Entreat yeah, the Angels, and Kill you. at that point, I think there are other things you'd rather do. I will point out, we were extremely wrong about Delve cards last time around, so... Uh, kind of tiptoeing on this one right now. I, just, I think, um, like, the 8 is clearly doable. I think the triple blue is where it's really going to be hard. And I think that's going to require a deck, like, heavy on the basics, um, while still putting a lot of stuff into the graveyard. Um, I, I can't think of a deck that does that. I mean, um, maybe Merfolk, if a lot of your dudes get killed, or if you put some spells into it. Um, Delver, if Delver becomes... Uh, a lot more heavy on the basics could definitely do it. Just like a blue well, red. I mean, deck. I guess it may be a stone blade deck. Yeah, yeah, stone blade. Um, they're ten. They tend to be heavy on basics, and uh, I guess then at that point you have to say with with delve eight, would you rather be treasure cruising or digging through time rather than time walk? I think you probably would. Okay, this is yeah definitely something that uh, we'll be keeping an eye on. Um, taking extra turns is always good. Three is this the lowest we've seen it since time walk? I believe there, so. There might be another one, but I can't think of one. And if it, there is, uh, it's not one that sees a whole lot of play. Yeah, because is there anyone at four right now? Actually, I'm trying to think. Like, because five is obviously the gold standard, I think. Like, we know. Yeah. Um, well, Temporal Mastery is seven, but it's just straight up time walk on a miracle. And I've only seen Temporal Mastery in play uh, a couple times ever. Granted, that requires a different type of setup, but... Uh, yeah, three is definitely an amount I am willing to pay for Time Walk. I'm just not sure if Triple Blue and Eight Delve is uh, how much I want to pay for it. Yeah, I agree. So I guess, um, do you, do you want to try and like make a call on this? Is this going to be like, uh, we're going to see like four or eight of these in the next open? Uh, out of 250 people, maybe. <laughs> no, I think it'll see play, maybe people will be trying it, I think as a one of here and there, just to see. But I think people have better things to do. With their mana, to be honest, like I think if I want to be using my car the cards in my graveyard as a resource, I think you want to be cruising or del or uh, digging. All right, and now one more question for you: Did this start out at eight blue blue or nine blue blue, and then they saw Treasure Cruise and upped it? Possibly. Possibly. Like, is this card playable at say nine blue? Nine and a blue, one hundred percent. Yes, yes, that card is is extremely because, well, playable. And, well, besides that, like even if I can't delve the full nine. I have no problem paying, you know, red, green, blue for it, or something like that, or you know, yeah, exactly, or blue. I don't mind. Or sorry, uh, ten blue because of it's even anyway, ten blue. You I know think, what I mean? Yeah, I think ten blue you could do. You're, you're you delve a lot. You have you know three or four mana producers. I think that would be fine. So yeah, I would not be at all surprised uh, if at some point we learned that this was supposed to be uh, less color heavy. Yeah, I think they uh, hopefully learned their lesson. Hmm. I certainly thought, I mean, I think we all did, or some of us did, 
thought that the other Delve cards were too expensive. and But turns out, nope. Just throw away your value for extra cards. Fuck it. Don't even worry. Let's just move on. All right. I, I hate talking about this card. <laughs> uh, 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 Gurmag Angler. Gurmag Angler, uh, which a friend of mine did very well in the pre-release with uh, last weekend. This is a creature zombie fish, which is already pretty awesome. Six and a black, 5-5 five, five Delve. So this is a 5-5 five, five for one or two. Yeah. So I mean, we, I mean, I've I have shown that uh, Rug Mandrels is is a deck. So Hooting Mandrels does see play or can see play in Legacy and do well. So we know that five and a green is good enough, and you definitely have cards left over in the graveyard. Six and black, yeah, you're going to be casting this for one or two, and it's a five five. I think the only real problem with this is you probably want to be playing Deathrite Shaman in a black deck. So where I think this is most likely to see play is a deck. Um, not Pox, but the kind of deck that's playing him to Turok, target to discard, uh, the kind of deck that's filling its graveyard with uh, discard spells while also not playing Death Ration, I think is the most likely spot to see something like that. I agree. The only thing that I don't like about this card is, okay, it, does, it doesn't get hit by Bolt, Decay. Everything gets hit by Swords, I'm not worried about that. But it doesn't have any evasion. Tomb Stalker at least flies. Hooting Mandrels has Trample. This is a 5-5 five five that's going to get blocked by uh, Pyromancer tokens. Well, so you bring up a good point. You're comparing it to... Uh, what was it? <laughs> Tomb Stalker? Yeah, Tomb Stalker. The other comparison would be from Khans, Necropolis Fiend, which is 7 black black for a 4-5 flying Dell. Had another ability, but um, I guess the, the real point, though, is if you're only paying one mana for it, I don't mind that it doesn't have flying. Sure, but... But you'd rather pay... The only thing is when you're considering, like... When you're considering legacy deck construction, okay, I have this 5-5... Five five, I need to be doing something else. So, it's. I mean, you definitely could be playing, say, sweepers like all creatures get minus one, minus one, or whatever, to make sure this actually gets through, but it would help if it had trample or something. I think another point about this is 5-5, um, five, five, given... If we assume that you delved six, 5-5 five, five is very likely to be larger than their Tormor Blade. Yes, Because that is true. if you're delving six, you're probably delving most of your grave. And if you are playing this in a Death Rite Shaman deck, their Tormor Blade is probably like a 2-3 or so. Yeah, because you're going to be also feeding off of their lovely, delicious graveyard. See, so, yeah, I could definitely see something like this. Um, Maybe in, like, The Gate or something? Yeah, The Gate, Eva Green would be another deck. Um, yeah, I, I really like the idea of this card. Um, and, like, being, being that this is a, uh, a common, it's definitely uh, going to be something that people can afford to just try out. It will be something that we probably hear a lot about because I'm sure it's insane and limited. Oh yeah, but, um, I mean limited. It's I'm sure it's great. But uh, yeah, I'd I'd be really interested to see what people are going to be doing with this. I definitely think it's playable. I'm just not sure where exactly it slots in. I mean, um, maybe even just like Bug Delver, and just yeah, be willing, maybe. be willing to take the hit on your Goyf and hopefully feed off their yard or have so many just fill your yard so much that the Delve Six doesn't matter that much. Maybe we'll see. I think I think it might see a little bit of play. Right, on the next one, we've got um. Creatures with hybrid mana abilities start with the legends. These guys are all going to be really fun in EDH. Uh, the first one is Tassiger. Is that how you think that's pronounced? Tassiger. Tassiger, the Golden Fang. Five and a black. Delve. Four, five. Uh, legendary creature, human shaman. So, so far, all of that's pretty good. Four, five um, for, uh, for, one. for one. Yeah. And then his ability is two. Green, blue, hybrid. Green, blue, hybrid. So that's four total. Put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard, then return a non-land card of an opponent's choice from your graveyard to your hand. So every time that you give an opponent a choice, I'm not a huge fan of. Certainly. That's uh, Four mana to do that, not the greatest. However, if all of your spells are pretty powerful anyway, or you have very limited options in what you can actually put into the graveyard, for example, say there's only like three cards in the graveyard now. Oops, two of them are lands. Guess I'm getting back that abrupt decay or something. And I think that's especially that okay. relevant with Delve. Is there's a there's a very strong possibility that when you put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard, those will be the only two cards in your graveyard. Exactly. And since you're playing blue or green, you can be Sylvan librarying, topping, brainstorming, pondering to decide what those cards are. And you're right, you give the opponent a choice, and you're going to be getting the worst of those two cards, but you can still choose to put some pretty good cards in your grave that way. And the question is, is four mana too much mana to do that, though? Yeah, I think so. I, I think he's EDH-friendly. He's certainly EDH-friendly, because he's a bug general. I'm sorry, uh, a, a salty general. But what did you just say to me? 
I don't know. I, I think there's there's certainly merit to this, and putting cards into your graveyard can be a very strong ability. Um, it's a 4-5 for essentially one, which is very good. He's better than Tarmogoyf. Yeah, a lot of the times he is going to be better than Tarmogoyf. He's going to shrink their Tarmogoyf while being a 4-5. So do you think he'll see play in the Legacy? Um, I, I really don't think so. No. There, I, there are some people talking about him in Bug in Vintage. Okay, well, that's a different story. And uh, I think one of the advantages there is you can kind of lock down the game and then use this to uh, to dump cards in your graveyard to make Deathrite Shaman do stuff. You can also make your Yawgmoth's Will better this way by just dumping more and more. Essentially, by doing this before you will, you're just drawing the You're cards. just filling it up. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next one. Soulfire Grandmaster. One in white for a 2-2. A human monk with lifelink. That states instant and sorcery cards you control have lifelink. Interesting. Two, hybrid red, hybrid blue. Hybrid red, hybrid blue. Again, a four mana total. The next time you cast an instant or sorcery spell from your hand this turn, put that card into your hand instead of into your graveyard as it resolves. So this is the pseudo buyback. So first off, 2-2 uh, two, two for 2 with lifelink. We're already above the curve. I think that this card is possibly playable without the pseudo buyback. Instant and sorcery spells you control have lifelink in a red deck, which you're probably playing given that the ability is blue-red. It's pretty good. Um, my immediate thought with this is Boros Burn has been a deck in modern, not not tier one, kind of on the fringes, but you see it a lot on uh, Magic Online. And um, I think this is definitely something that could see play in that style deck, because especially with Burn and Blue-Red Delver being as popular as they are, um, while yes, you don't want to spend your second turn putting this guy into play, if you do that and they don't immediately kill it, you're going to outrace them. You're going to make it where they just can't draw enough bolt effects to kill you. Now, what about in a situation... So, let's go over a scenario. You have Soulfire Grandmaster out, and you Lightning Bolt a Delver of Secrets. Yep. What happens? You gain three life, and you've bolted a Delver. Is that correct? Yeah. So, if you were to cast Lightning Helix, because lifelink is not the same as just gaining life, you would deal three damage to target creature or player and gain six life. Yep. This seems okay. I, I really, I think the only problem with it is I think most people are going to know to immediately kill this on the spot. And it's not like Core Firewalker where, you know, Pro Red makes it a lot, you know, it only gets one life off each red spell. But the Pro Red is a huge thing. And I think the places where this is most valuable, people are just going to kill it on the spot. Sure, but they have to kill other cards that, on the spot as well. Stoneforge Mystic, you know. I think if it comes down to S Stoneforge Mystic or Soulfire Grandmaster, I'm probably killing Stonefire Soulfire Grandmaster first. And I'm okay with that because then I get Batter Skull. What do you think about? The, you know what uh, I mean? Like yeah. it's 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 like how many pieces of removal do you have to have for creatures that you have to kill? So so you're wanting to play this in something other than a deck with a ton of damage. You're wanting to play it in like maybe like red white Stoneforge. Or are you going full blue red white? Um, maybe red white to try. You could always run blue red white like Patriot again. I'm not sure if it's good enough. Like, you need to run Burn alongside of it to make it worthwhile. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know, it still seems okay. Like, even if you're playing a deck, even, like, some sort of, like, Patriot deck, that's a little bit more mid-range, and just running four Bolt and, you know, maybe, like, a Fire Ice or something like that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, so the buyback, is that gonna get used a lot? In Legacy, no. Four mana's too much. Yeah, I think four mana's too much, which is really sad, because I would love to go six, or, like, I guess it would be eight mana total go. Price of progress. Return this to my hand. Price of progress. I would love to do that. I know the odds of that happening are really low. If you want to live the dream, you can. Yeah. I, but could you imagine, like, how much life do you gain off of that? I mean, uh, price you're, of progress. You're not gaining life off of it. You're casting Yeah, I was going to say. Um, the only problem with this is, um, let's point out that last clause again. Put that card into your hand instead of your graveyard as it resolves. So it has to resolve for you to be able to get it back. Ah. Very smart. Interesting. I think the card has play. Lots of play? Eh. Yeah, I think um, this is kind of a build around me card, which isn't a, isn't a bad thing, but I, I don't think it just slots straight into anything that exists right now. I agree. Um, maybe if you had some way in these colors to get mana faster so that you could be using that buyback more effectively or so that you, know, you could be playing this and bolting them immediately so that you have guaranteed value out of it. That would uh, be a little stronger. I can't think of any deck where that's really going to... I can't think of like any combination of cards where that's real likely to happen. Now. I think you want to play this on turn two, and the decks where you're going to play it on turn two are going to only have two mana on turn two. And then the next turn, you probably want to like bolt some creatures. Yeah, and 
if they're playing red at all, this is probably dead before you've cast that light. Yep, but that's okay. Moving on. Let's talk about possibly the coolest card name in the entire set. Alicia, who smiles at death. How great is that? That is pretty great. So it's a 3-2 uh, for 3, so 2 and a red. And it has first strike. So again, are we above the curve? I think so. It's also a human warrior. And let's point out that uh, Cavern of Souls on human is good, and cowards cannot block warriors. Well, there you go. So whenever Alicia attacks, you may pay black-white hybrid, black-white hybrid. If you do, return target creature with power 2 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped and attacking. That's pretty cool. I love it. Um, I really like it. <clears throat> I agree. My immediate thought is to take a Dega deck somewhat similar to what Sean ran at Gen Con and just slam like three or four of these in here. Um, you go, you play this on turn three, you leave your mana open through your main phase, attack, pay two, bring back Stoneforge Mystic, uh, Thalia, Bob. I, like Stoneforge Mystic and Thalia are the ones I'd really like. Uh, Bob would be fine. Um, those are the three super obvious targets in those colors. Um I'm sure you could think of a few more. Oh, uh, Mom would be good here, though I don't really want to attack oh, yeah. with her. I think there's a lot of great targets. I think... There... It's an interesting, like, sort of, like, pseudo sort of light and shadow ability, right? Like, you get a creature back that's died, and oops, it's already attacking. Well, I think... Uh, Brimez? The, the big ad... Oh, Brimez is three. I think the yeah. big advantage to this over light and shadow is the fact, like, light and shadow, you're going three for the three for the equipment, two to equip, plus having to get the guy. This is just three, and next turn you're probably getting a dude back. I think yep. this has the potential to make um, to make Mardu slash Dega an actual deck in Legacy because it's going to make their removal a lot worse. At least non sort of supply shows removal. Yeah, um, I think that the reason that this has three power is so that you can't play one of these and get another one back and just like flip them. I agree. I think they kind of they probably tested that and went like, eh, this might be a little bit too good. However, I do like three two first strike because. So what are you not killing? Like, Tarmogoyf, Trune Nemesis, obviously, but everything else in the format? Like, let's, like, not Tombstalker, Baneslayer, Angel, whatever. But everything else, you're doing you're all right. The every time that's that. Not high end. Yeah. So I feel pretty okay with this. Yeah. And it's only a rare, so it shouldn't be too expensive, which means I will probably be straight up just buying four of these, because I would love to try this out. Um, and like I said, Return Thalia would be my most obvious choice. So unfortunately, uh, but what what are some other things that you think uh, you might be trying to get in these colors? Well, since I was just uh, doing a Dega list, uh, Grim Lava Mancer, uh, Deathrite Shaman, Orzov Pontiff. Ooh, spicy. Um, Goblin Guide. Yep, Goblin Guide is good. Um, uh, what's the oh, what's the Burn Guide? You know what this would be really good with? Eidolon. Um, we're not going to talk about any cards with this mechanic, so one thing this would be really good with, unfortunately, I don't think there are any worth talking about right now, is there is a new mechanic called Dash. And Dash is kind of like Turbo Haste. It's, um, instead of paying the creature's mana cost, you can pay its Dash cost, it comes into play, it attacks, and then it immediately kills itself. Goblin Rabble Master? Yeah. Yeah, Rabble Master could, uh, could, could get along well with this. But I think, like, like I said, I think Dash is a really, really interesting mechanic with this. Unfortunately, I don't think there's any really great choices. I guess maybe even, like, no. um, Hellspark Elemental? Just recur Hellspark yeah, Elemental over and over again? Well, isn't Hellspark a 3-1, though? Is it? Oh, you're right. That's too bad. Yeah, it's unfortunate. So I think this one is actually out of all the generals so far. Like, this seems pretty okay. I think it's more than okay. I think this is fantastic. I will definitely and it's be fun. attempting to do something with this. It's not overpowered. It's just like it's just solid. Yeah. Which I like. However, we need to move on to something that is near and dear to my heart. Warden of the First Tree. One green mana for a 1-1. One, one. It's a human. Again, Cavern of Humans. We're getting there. All right, so he's basically a pseudo uh, figure of destiny. Let, okay? Let's actually read all three abilities, <laughs> even Oof. though they're kind of weird. All right, so one black-white hybrid. So now from the next, like, when I'm talking about this card, I'm just going to say hybrid, and it means black-white hybrid. Okay. Right. So one in a hybrid. Warden of the First Tree becomes a human warrior with base power and toughness 3-3. Three, three. Okay? Not bad. Yeah, so that it goes from a 1-1 one, one for 1 to a 3-3 three, three for 3. And that's that's okay. I Because you attack mid-combat, you have tricks, great. If your opponent's not paying attention, wonderful. Okay? Two hybrid hybrid. If Warden of the First Tree is a warrior, which he will be, uh, if you're doing it in order... It becomes a human spirit warrior with trample and lifelink. So 3-3 three, three, trample lifelink. Also not bad. No boost in the power toughness, but okay. And you've now uh, paid 4, 6, 7 mana for it. Yep. But that's over the course of probably 2 or 3 turns. Yeah, so you would have to do that on turn 4, obviously. Uh, and then on turn 6, uh, 3 hybrid, hybrid, hybrid. 
if Warden of the First Tree is a spirit, again, which it will be, put 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. So it goes to an 8-8 Trample Lifelink. Um, important thing about that last ability, it does not change types again. It just remains a spirit. So you can activate that over and over again. Which is really cool. Yeah, so you can go from a 3-3 three, three to an 8-8 eight, eight to, I mean, if, if you have 6 mana to burn, you can go from a 3-3 three, three to a 13-13 uh, thirteen, thirteen in one turn. Yeah, and I think where this is most likely to see play, this is in junk colors, so we're probably playing Noble Hierarch. Um, Nick Fit would be a really obvious choice because you can pump this guy up really, really fast. Um, th there's a lot of places where this could go, and um, I think you can get it big really, really fast, especially in those colors. You're gonna have a lot of ramp. The only problem that I see with this is he gets hit by all pieces of major removal. So Lightning Bolt will hit him up until like he will still be a. When he's a 3-3, he's still hit by Lightning Bolt. He will always be hit by Abrupt Decay, no matter how big he is. And again, Sword Splash has. So he's fragile, but he's interesting. Reminds me of like a Draga Tree Sweep. Yeah. I think it, it might see some play, but it. I think it... I don't know if it'll be in Legacy. Too much, too, it's too easy to remove. I think it's just a little too easy to remove, and he doesn't... Like, if he became a 3-3, and then with the 4 ability, he became a, say, 5-5 or Even something like that. Even if he like became that. a 3-4. If yeah, he, just he got out of to, range. Yeah, I think if he needed he needs to get buff to get out of bolt range, I agree. So probably not gonna see a lot of play? Probably not. This is unfortunate. This is this is definitely right on the borderline. I agree. It's it's the it dies too much of the removal. If it, if any of its abilities made it a three four. Because if I'm playing against this, what what I'm probably doing is waiting for them to activate the second level so they've spent seven mana on it they make it a three three with trample and lifelink and then I'm just and then you just bolt it and uh, yeah. i'll say yeah you can sure you can attack me for three over and over again and as soon as you activate that last one you've invested a lot of mana i'm just gonna bolt it and like i think even if this card just had protection from red this card is playable now another thing that you can do with this you don't have to play this in junk colors that's hybrid mana so bant Yep. You and if you play this in like a Bant deck, you would have control to kind of uh, prevent that from happening. You know, and even just you know days is going to help a lot. Just uh, why you know pro red? That's all I have to say. That's the second time we've said that today. It's like Lightning yep. Bolt is really, really good. Yep. <laughs> yes, it is. This guy also has cool art. I like that axe. I like his hat. I really all like all the game. flavor in this set is good. Don't get oh, me yeah. wrong. The flavor, but... the flavor of this set is really good. I, I might actually like draft this set a couple times because like a lot of the cards have really cool interactions. Like I said, like dash earlier. But all good things must come to an end, so we got to move on. All right, our next mechanic is manifest, and I'm just going to read it straight off of a card. To manifest a card, put it onto the battle. Uh, take the top card of your library, put it onto the battlefield face down as a two-two creature. Turn it face up any time for its mana cost if it's a creature card. What's extremely important to know here is that when when you unmorph something, when you turn it face up, which is the unmorph ability, it does not trigger enter the battlefield ability. What might I want to put into play off of essentially morph that has enter the battlefield abilities that I don't want to trigger? You know what comes to mind. Phyrexian Dreadnought. <clears throat> and this is that's the big thing uh, a lot of people have talked about this with. You pay one or two for one of these spells, you pay one to flip it, and then you have 12-12. Yeah, and remember, it doesn't use the stack as well. Yes, it also doesn't use the stack, so they can't respond to it. Um, and Abrupt Decay is seeing a lot less play than it used to, which is a big reason that a deck like Stifle Knot was uh, seeing a lot less play. Um, I think this is it's a possibility. Let's discuss some of the cards and talk about whether or not these can slot into the kind of deck where we want to play it or not. Sure, so the first one is Soul Summon. So it's a one and a white, and all it does is manifest. It's also a sorcery, important to, to uh, yeah. point out. So this card is probably okay, but are there better manifest well, cards out there? So I just I want to talk about this just for a second, though. Like What okay. we're talking about is spending three mana. For three mana, on turn three, you have a 12-12 and two mana. While three mana and two cards is kind of a lot, a 12-12 with two mana up on turn three is awesome. And even if you don't have the Dreadnought on top, you can just get a Chump Blocker. You can dump a bad card, which is another one of the great things about Manifest. If you, like, you've been topping or brainstorming or whatever, and you just need to get rid of that top card, you can just, you know, yeah, I'll make a 2-2. Two -two. That's fine. It turns it into pressure. So, like, a useless spell can become a 2-2, two -two, which, you know, we found against Miracles and stuff like that. Sometimes you just want pressure instead of just garbage. And like you said, the flavor is good of this set. And I, I would love to just manifest. And I would love to build a manifest deck in maybe not standard, but in kitchen table. Um, our next card on our list, another manifest card. Uh, I think possibly the one more likely to see play with a card like Dreadnought 
is Cloud Form. It's one blue blue, it's an enchantment. When Cloud Form enters the battlefield, it becomes an aura with Enchant Creature. Manifest the top card of your library and attach Cloud Form to it. Enchanted Creature has flying and hexproof. So we're paying three mana plus the one to flip uh to flip our dreadnought. So four mana, and now our dreadnought can only die to sweepers. That's pretty darn good. Is this better than uh than soul summons? I mean we're, we're talking three mana, yes. we're talking double blue. So I think with soul summons the problem is so say you actually do it on turn two and you do hit the dreadnought. There is that mo there is because you are tapped out, there is a time when he's quite vulnerable, the dreadnought. Because he is just going to be a 2-2. With Cloud Form, there's actually no opportunity for them to kill him even as a 2-2 because he has Flying and Hexproof as a 2-2. So next turn, when you round up to turn 4, you're going to attack with this thing, flip, and you know blow them out. So I think because he's protected the entire kind of the entire the entire stretch of the way, like you want to be playing this over just just manifesting him. I'll also point out. We're talking, we're talking double blue. I think you're going to be playing blue in this deck anyway, because you're going to want to brainstorm and ponder and stuff to get this guy on top of the library to manifest. And stifle it. And you case. probably just want to go ahead and play stifle, yeah, and just have the alternate plan of one and a blue get a 12 12. Yeah, so I think that I think people will definitely be trying this. I'd be interested to see. In fact, when I say I'd be interested to see, what I mean is I am typing it in right now. How much. There's already a thread. How much has. Uh, no, not that. I want to know how much has Dreadnought gone up. So in April of 2014, it was $14, and today it is 9 So these cards have done very little to affect the price of Brexian. Oh, well, actually, I'm, I'm actually just witnessing, I'm looking at a graph here where it's gone from 10 to, uh, to 8 to 8, back up to 9. Yeah, and TCG mid is 13 So I guess pe- uh, people aren't super excited about it, or, I mean, this was a deck four or five years ago. Could just be that the kind of people who want to play this deck already have this card. Yep, I know I have this card, or I used to have this card at least. I didn't, because it, it used to be like $25 when you could play it. It's true. <laughs> Alright, I've got one more manifest card here. Reality Shift. One in a blue, instant. Exile target creature, its controller manifests the top card of his or her library. So we're turning target creature into a 2-2 and removing the top card of, the, of that player's library. That could be quite interesting. Yeah, um, messing at the top of the library is something we know is quite good, especially against a deck like Miracles. Um, exiling a creature is obviously something that's quite good. Um, and I think the fact that it has manifest means you could play this, like, it could be good to play this on your own on your own cards, too. Like exiling a token and then getting rid of clearing off a really shitty spell and turning it into a 2-2 yeah, is not clear, bad. clearing a spell or putting in something better. Yeah, I, like a dreadnought, or especially something that uh, that's probably going to get countered. Like you know, end of turn, turn one of my things into a manifest. Uh, in my next turn, turn it back into the dude it's supposed to be. Like a Galactic or something. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 possible. The only thing, like, for, like if you're thinking, oh, this seems like a really good card against miracles. Well, you have to exile their creature. Yeah. So no, like you I have to hope that they already have Snapcaster or something. Else. That's the the real problem of against against a deck like miracles with this. I still think you know. Against decks that play with the top of their library, which is every deck that plays blue, you can still really mess them up by removing the top card. Like, if you did this, like, end of your upkeep reality shift, they're probably going to be really annoyed if they brainstormed it into turn. Oh, exactly. Like, say they're setting up a Delver or something like that, and then you're like, oops, get rid of your Delver, and oh, the card that you wanted to flip to it, which might be Force of Will or whatever, oh, that's a that's just a generic 2-2. Nobody gives a shit about that. Yep. Yeah, I, I really like the idea of the card. Um, not sure how playable it's going to be, mostly because there's not that many big creatures that you want to exile anymore. Like the the main creatures that you want to exile are creatures that either have protection or like Grizzlebrand are going to draw fifty cards and just say, okay, uh, you exiled it. I drew twenty one cards. Yeah, it's meh. We'll see. I don't think it'll see a lot of legacy play though. Well, that's too bad. Moving on. Monastery Mentor. This is the return of Prowess. I'll let you read it, because I know that you're going to uh, be less excited than me. That way I can have an awesome reaction every time you say something. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, sure. Monastery Mentor. Two and a white. Ooh. Two, two. Ooh. It has Prowess. That's good. Tell me more. And then whenever you cast a non-creature spell, put a 1-1 white monk creature token onto the battlefield. So it's, it's white young pyromancer. But those tokens have prowess. What? Yeah. So let's kind of run through a practical scenario. So you cast a brainstorm. 
you cast this on turn three, you untap its turn four, you play land, you cast Brainstorm. What happens? You get a token. So, you get a 1-1 one, one Mike. Monk. Not Mike. Monk. Now, your Monastery Mentor is now a 3-3. Three, three. You proceed to cast another spell. What happens next? Now it's a 4-4, four, four, and you have a token that's a 2-2, two, two, and you have a token that's a 1-1. One, one. Excellent. So what happens next if you cast a Zealous Persecution? Oh my god. <laughs> this math gets really complicated. I'm glad I mostly want to play this card on uh, Moda in my tokens deck. Okay, so point being, he produces a lot of tokens uh, that get up there quite quickly. So... I, 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 I want to address real quick, like, just rewind a second. So what we're talking about is paying one mana more than Young Pyromancer. It doesn't die to Electricery. It doesn't die to Zealous Persecution. It doesn't die to Golgari Charm. It creates creatures exactly in the same way that Young Pyromancer does. It has prowess. That alone, I think, would make it playable. Giving the creatures prowess is utterly ridiculous. I think it is very, very good. And, like, the, the one of the reasons it's super ridiculous is, like, uh, if they go swords this dude and you're just response brainstorm, you've got a 1-1 one, one with prowess. Essentially, you've got a uh, the, the red guy from cons. So, like, if you make yeah. one token off of this, you've still produced pretty good value because, you know, you, you've paid three mana to get a 1-1 one, one with prowess and remove a card from them. Yep, I agree. He is very solid. So let's talk... So the question is, where will it... See, play, like, does blue-red want this? Well, no, because they don't want to splash another color. Well, I think where this has to go is you, you, you've you got to play blue to trigger the ability. You pro- yep. You've got to play white to cast the card. And you probably yep. want to play red to play young pyromancer. Or even if not young pyromancer, just for removal, like cheaper removal spells, I think... You know the uh, you know BBD how he won the uh, the New Jersey tournament. Yes, I did with know that. that. I did know how he did that. I was there. Yes, yes, I'm sure a lot of you uh, may have seen or heard about that. He played the Stoneforge Mystic Young Pyromancer deck. That was kind of like the hybrid between the the aggro and the control builds of those two decks, and he he did quite well as we saw. I think in that deck where you're kind of trying to be like the mid range deck, this is a better card than Young Pyromancer. I think uh, the, the the real place where you have to decide between this and Young Pyromancer is Young Pyromancer is a turn two play. And in Legacy, that's a very big deal. Um, we're talking about playing this in two or more colors. It's very possible that on turn three, you don't have three lands. It's, they've wasted one of them, um, or your brainstorm hasn't hit one. The, the three mana will make it difficult to cast, but there's so much upside to this card. I don't mind the difficulty. Well, what I'm saying is like on turn... Two, you could be playing Stoneforge Mystic. On turn three, you play this guy. On turn four, who knows what happens? On turn four, you cast GTA, make a token, equip GTA, attack. Ooh. And it's important also to realize that just like with Young Pyromancer and all the other prowess cards, you do not have to resolve the spell to trigger it. You only have to cast it, which is something uh, I've seen a couple people get confused by. Um, remember that cards like Chalice of Void, they don't say you can't play the card. They just say it gets countered. And if they remember the trigger, if I have two young pyromancers in play, I don't mind play- paying one blue mana to discard brainstorm and make two guys. And in a deck with monastery mentor, I don't mind paying one blue mana to make a token with prowess and trigger all of my other things that have prowess. You've also been saying prowess. I have on purpose. I was or... going to go through and edit all of them. So thanks for pointing it out. Okay. Well, we can just let you say prowess the entire time. It's really unfortunate that this is a mythic. I think this card. I I have not checked the pre-order price for this card, so let's. I'm gonna put a number out into the universe and see where I hit twenty to twenty-five pre-order. Uh, when this was announced, SCG sold out at I believe twenty-five, and Oof. then raised their pre-order to forty. Now the cards are out in the open now because we've had pre-release. So today it's down to twenty-eight mid. But I think this is probably the chase mythic of the set. Um, because like Jeskai Tokens is a deck in standard. If you just throw this in a deck with Jeskai Ascendancy, sick. Totally great. Jeskai Ascendancy triggers this dude. So yeah, I th- think this card will be high value the entire time it's in standard. I think it's completely playable in at least Legacy and Modern. Um, it's possibly playable in Vintage, because Prowess triggers off of every single piece of the Power Nine. Ooh. So like, you, you could, you know, in Magical Christmas Land, go like... Lotus, crack on white. Monastery mentor. Mox, trigger. I'm sorry, Mox, trigger, trigger. Nether Mox, trigger, trigger, trigger. Young Pyromancer. Ooh. 
Ooh. I'll be playing this in my. It's too good. I'll be playing this in my token deck. The other direction you could go with this, uh, like I said, I think you absolutely have to play blue with a card like this. Is oh, yeah. um, Esper and play like Lingering Souls, uh, some black removal, and some hand disruption. Ooh, I like. Yeah, because like you go Lingering Souls, trigger, trigger, make two dudes. Flashback Lingering Souls, trigger, 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 make some dudes. Or even Cabal Therapy, right? Yeah. Cabal Therapy, make a guy. Flashback, make just, a guy, trigger. I feel a lot more sad about casting Cabal Therapy on this guy when the tokens are so powerful. Sure, but you could also be playing it in a deck with that produces tokens like Lingering Souls, like you were saying, yeah. right? Like, So I think this guy will see some play. Oh, God. This guy will see lots of play. He's, he's so insane. Like, if the, if the monks didn't have prowess, he would still be very good. Yes. So I'm not sure why they... Will it be too good? I don't know. Too good is hard to say. I don't think it'll be too good. I don't think it'll, I think be too it'll just be very strong. It costs three. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. You announce this one. All right, which one is next? I want to. Ha- uh, I want to have a good reaction. It's Dark Deal. Dark Deal. All right, so now we're on to the cards that we don't have specific mechanics for. Dark Deal. Two and a black. Good name. I like it already. Uh, uh, the the art is really cool too. It's like an evil version of a Johnny, and he's talking to some dude in a hood who's got a hood but no shirt on, which is kind of odd. And they're exchanging something that looks like. Um, like if a lightsaber a was like <laughs> six inches thick and only a foot long, each player discards all of the cards in his or her hand, then draws okay, that I like many that already. cards minus one. So this is essentially semi Wheel of Fortune. Uh, Windfall would be a more accurate comparison. Windfall, yeah. And the problem with this is that it's however many you had minus one, and Windfall. The primary reason that you're going to cast Windfall is they have seven cards in hand, you have none, and then you draw seven cards. Yeah. So I think all of the places where a card like Windfall is playable, this is maybe not unplayable, significantly less playable because it goes based off the number of cards you have, and you probably want to play this in a combo deck where you don't have very many cards in hand. Well, I still like how this is very good with Notion Thief. Ooh. Because if you make them discard five cards and they only draw four, that's fine. You've mind-twisted them for five and you get to draw four cards. Well, if, if we're going to go that greedy... Let's play this guy on turn two. Let's play Dark Deal on turn two and play Chain, or sorry, turn three and play Chains on turn two. Oh baby! But then we also get mucked. Yeah, I don't know. So that sounds bad. Let's it, not it, do it's that. a cool card. It's uh, it's got room to go somewhere. I think the problem is look at all the cards that do similar things, and they are all pretty pretty significantly better. I mean, I guess you could play this in Legacy in a combo deck simply because it's the only one of these that's legal. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, and maybe you do it when you don't have that many good cards in hand. I think I'd rather just pay one black more, or sorry, two black more, and get an ad nauseum. Yeah, probably. Cool card, though. I like it. Goblin Boom Keg. This card has utterly fantastic art. This card is a four-mana artifact. Ooh, four-mana artifact. Vintage. I like the sounds of this. So, it's like a juggernaut. Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice Goblin Boom Keg. Oh, now I'm sad. When Goblin Boom Keg is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, it deals three damage to target creature or player. Hey. So, four mana, deal three damage to target creature or player. Um, delayed. Yeah, delayed. Let's go ahead and go with the super obvious place that I want to use this. Is I also, Mud. I want, well, yeah, I want to use it in a workshop deck and play it on turn one or two. I want to use it in a red workshop deck and keep up that goblin theme and weld this into play every single time. Okay. I I like the sounds of this. So, in Legacy, where do you want to play this card? So, I mean, do you have, as, as an artifact-based deck, do you have problems getting damage in? Mm, no. Like, maybe Duretti? Like, maybe some sort of, like, Duretti control deck where you're like, oh, bring this back, and I'm sitting behind in the Saren Bridge, so you can't attack me. But I think, like, in some ways you just rather play Koth or something. I, th- I think where this is best is in, like we're saying, a mud-type deck that has red in it. So I'm thinking, if you're saying le- in Legacy, I'm thinking like a Koldotha red deck. Where, yes, you could play Koth and you could play Duretti, or you could play Goblin Walder for only one mana. Yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. I don't think... I think this is a fun card. Really, really fun. Don't get me wrong. Do I think this is extremely playable in Legacy? Mm. I, I still think I think you're looking at it a little wrong. I don't think this slots into a regular mud deck. I think where you're playing this is you're playing in a deck where you lock them down, and then you have one or two things that can kill them, and you just do those things repeatedly, like recurring goblin boom keg, or having like one or two giant creatures in the deck, 
And then the rest of the deck is Sphere Effects, uh, is Trinisphere, yeah, Blood Moon, Chalice of the Void, yeah. And that the idea is you lock them out and just recur this over and over again. Also, or Academy Runes, I guess, recursion. Yeah, you could Academy Runes this, I suppose. Um, I don't think you want to be playing this in an Academy Runes deck unless you're playing Blue Shops, which is weird. I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff out there. Yeah, because if you play this in an Academy Ruins deck, you're spending a lot of mana every turn to do that. The only thing I'm worried about is, like, at some point you might run out of artifacts to play to, like, weld this in. That's okay. That's why you play more than one of these. And then you... Yeah, because you true. Then you weld them... Weld cake for cake. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I really, I really really like this. Um, and I, I think that's where it goes. I think you lock them, lock them out and just use it over and over again. Also important, it's creature or player. So if... It hits Jace. It hits Jace, because it hits players. It also hits um, Trigon Predator, which is going to be a big deal on a, against a lot of uh, shop stacks, is being able to get rid of their Trigon Predator. That would be blowing up all of the rest of your lock pieces. Gets around uh, protections, because it's an artifact. Yeah, it does. It gets around most protections. I think it's definitely playable, less so in Legacy than in Vintage. Yeah, I like it. It's also fun. Yeah, it, to be honest, it, it look like the art and everything. It's very flavorful. I like it. The art, because this is an audio only podcast, is a cart that has a giant keg with a fuse coming from it, and the keg has a giant like face on it that is baring its teeth, and then there is a goblin on top of the keg with a torch with a giant smile on his face. It's it's all I've ever wanted. That's what he's <laughs> that's what he's looking like. Yes, Dragonfire spawned many imitations. Some were more dramatic than others. Next card, Grim Contest. I'm let you do the ooing and the eyeing. One black green. Yeah. No, ooh, ooh. One black Instant. green is a lot in, in Legacy and Vintage. This better do something awesome. Instant. Okay. <laughs> oh, that, it, it, that it was... still costs one black green. Choose target creature you control and target creature an opponent controls. Each of those creatures deal damage equal to its toughness to each other. So we're reverse fighting. Yeah. I put this on the list of cards for review because I know you really like the fight mechanic. Re- I do. Reverse fighting is going to be quite good in Doran. black green, yeah, in a Doran deck and a deck with Termagoyfs. What do you think? I think three mana is a lot. It's yeah, it's a lot. The only way that it, this would actually see reasonable amounts of play in Legacy is if it was hybrid black green, like one mana. Cool card. But it I won't. put it in here because I knew you liked the mechanic. I think one black green is way too much for this. I'd rather just play Maelstrom Pulse and kill the thing. But at one, if it was a one mana hybrid black green, would you play it? Oh, certainly. What about black green, like abrupt decay? I'd probably rather play abu- abrupt decay. Like, yeah. What am I hitting with this that I'm not hitting with abrupt decay? Yeah, totally. So I think one mana is the playable kind of realm. Two mana is unplayable. One mana with like drawback, like lose some life or something, might be still be playable. But overall, cool, interesting, not good. Yeah. And then this is the last card on my list, at least. Um, returning to the idea of artifacts that are really awesome. Three mana. Ooh. Workshops players should already be excited. It costs three mana. That's a turn one play with no power. It's an artifact creature, Golem. 4-4. Four, four. Cast huge stone retainers only if you've cast another spell this turn. So 4-4 four, four for three. Totally fantastic. The drawback mm, in a deck, or in, in a format with a lot of zero cost uh, spells, fantastic. What do you think? I agree. Vintage, it seems a lot better. So a Mox, a Lotus, uh, whatever, a Key, all of those seem really easy to be able to cast this cast this card. I mean, those are all no problem. In Legacy, what do you have to be doing? Like, a one-drop artifact, and then cast this? So, like, this is a turn four card, or a turn five card? Then it suddenly be- doesn't become as good. When this is a turn one card, this is okay. And even then, I think there's a little to be concerned about. Is a 4-4 four, four for three with what would Nothing. be a late game pretty big drawback? Um, is that the best thing we could be doing, or would I rather like if I'm if I'm casting another spell this turn? We're assuming that it's going to be a, a mox or something of that nature. I think I'd rather just pay four and have lodestone golem. It's it's a five three, which is a bigger threat, but it dies to bolt, but it's got that sphere effect on it. I, so okay, so if this had a sphere effect as well? Oh, if this had a sphere effect, it would be like restrictable. Okay, so too good. Yeah, um, I I, th- I think this is definitely good, definitely very playable. I think the biggest problem with this card is not that it's not good enough, but that there are things that I would rather do. Does that make sense? No, totally. Yeah. When you're already this deep, especially in Vintage, like, is this the most powerful thing you could be doing, casting a creature that does nothing else? Probably not. I, I mean, a 4-4 is still very good. However, I do want to read the flavor text. 
Their origins are shrouded in mystery. I believe they are the protectors of the lost secrets of our world. That's pretty cool. Like, like they're, uh, yeah. we're thinking, uh, like, like the terracotta warriors. Yeah. All right. What else are we, what else are we doing on this, this here cast? Um, that's all, that's all the individual cards I had. Did you have any individual cards you wanted? God, no. All right. So the other things I want to talk about real quick is just address the other mechanics, which we didn't address because we don't think they had enough good cards. Uh, dash, really cool. Uh, bolster is bolster some number. Choose a creature with the least toughness among creatures you control and put whatever the number was, plus one plus one counters on it. Yeah. It's, it's certainly a mechanic that has potential, and most of the cards with Bolster are doing other things, like the example card is Honor's Reward, two and a white, you gain four life, Bolster Tail. It, yeah. This is something, if, if the card's main effect was good enough, I think what I think where this type of mechanic would be playable in Eternal would be if the main card's effect, like the main effect of the card, was almost good enough, and Bolster put it over the top. As it is, I don't think there's any good enough bolster cards in the set. Uh, the other couple are um, the duels in this set are comes into play tapped, you gain a life. Um, I will personally love these for my Alora EDH deck. Uh, almost certainly unplayable in any Eternal format. Do you have any thoughts on those, Matt? Not really. And then the last one is modal enters the battlefield abilities. So the example card again. Hooded Assassin, two and a black, one, two, creature, human, assassin. When Hooded Assassin enters the battlefield, choose one, put plus one, plus one counter on Hooded Assassin, or destroy target creature that was dealt damage this turn. That's cool. It's something we've, we haven't seen before. Um, some of the other cards are things like they come into play, and when it enters the battlefield, choose cons or dragons. And if you choose cons, it has one effect. If you choose dragons, it has another effect. It's neat. I don't think any of them are uh, anything super special. I mean, Monastery Siege is somewhat interesting in some sort of, like, blue-based, like, enchantment artifact deck, so, like, targeting your stuff is a little bit more difficult. You should read the card when you talk about it. It's a new card. You should tell us what it does before you tell us oh. what you think of it. Okay. So let me read out Monastery Siege. I thought, I'm like, I know what the fuck it does. Get off my back. <laughs> Monastery Siege. Two and a blue. Enchantment. It's a rare. As Monastery Siege enters the battlefield, choose cons or dragons. So if you choose cons, at the beginning of your draw step, draw an additional card, then discard a card. So you get to loot. Uh, dragons. Spells your opponents cast that target you or a permanent you control cost two more to cast. So where is this card good, in my opinion? Chalice of Void control decks that are running blue, so you actually have a way to like filter at least a little bit. Um, and in multiples, you can either filter more or make your stuff harder to target. So this will actually make Abrupt Decay cost more, so they, you know, they have to kill your chalices, or your ensnaring bridges cost more, you know, etc. That's also if you chose cons, you could fuel your delve. Yeah. So I guess what you're what you're talking about playing this in is a lockout deck, where what you probably are doing to win in win is play, you know, a five five for one off delve from all the crap cards you've been discarding. Or you're just playing, like, Thopter Foundry or something like that. Like, you're just trying to lock them out, make it hard to actually remove any of the, any of the lock pieces. Perhaps they're under sphere effects as well. I don't know. Um, I think we decided in the blue-black Tezzeret thread that this card was not quite good enough, because it doesn't actually do anything. What would make it good enough? Would, it, would a lower cost be enough? I think a two mana. Okay. Playing it on turn one would be fine. Three mana is tough to do without playing Mox Diamond. Alright, fair enough. Yep. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I wanted to mention it because it's definitely uh, it's an interesting uh, place that we have not gone before. Um, Boldly gone where no one has gone before. Oh, the other thing that's worth noting is that there are fetch lands in Fate Reforged packs. So yeah, I heard about so that. that. So I felt bad paying twelve dollars for my uh, polluted deltas. Now Whatever. I feel real bad. Well, if it makes you feel better, I paid like eighty of mine. No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. They're old border, and I bought them. Oh, like that's a, that's here. not even the same. Come on, <laughs> come on now. Anything else out of this set we want to talk about? Any, any overall, mechanics, like, any not really. I mean, overall, this set seems fine. It's flavorful. The art's good. There's a, there's a lot of fun-looking stuff. In terms of legacy playables, I think Monastery Mentor is the is the front runner here. I and then I think that you're underselling it. Um, I asked this question. I don't think I asked it on the cast. I asked this question to you a few months ago. How many legacy playables do you expect a year? And I think we decided four or five, which is essentially one per set. And we've talked about three or four cards that will certainly be played. So this this set this set and cons as well have been very generous to us, especially after the pretty big disappointment that Theros Blob gave. 
Okay, fine. It's 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 the problem that being eternal players, um, every card looks bad when you compare them to Brainstorm and Tarmogoyf and Underground Sea. I mean, it's possible. Maybe I'm just underselling it. All right, do we have anything else we want to tack onto this cast? Um, play of the week, anything like that? Uh, locking somebody out with a Siege Rhino recurring nightmare loop. Siege Rhino for Siege Rhino and recurring nightmare and Nick Fit. That's pretty ridiculous. It was pretty great. They had Ensnaring Bridge up, and I uh, was drawing dead. So I was just like, oh, how am I getting out of this? And I drew a recurring nightmare, and I'm like, well, this is how I'm getting out of this. Goodbye. <laughs> it was pretty great. What about you? Uh, my play of the week is I've been playing this ridiculous tokens deck, and um, I'm going to type right now to put the deck list in there. Um, I've been playing this ridiculous tokens deck, and I uh, played against a guy where I had Cabal therapy at him. I knew that the only thing left in his hand were land double goyf. I had an ascendancy out and a bunch of tokens. Yep. Uh, he goes land goyf go. I do something. Pass back. He attacks with goyf. I block with a spirit token from uh, lingering souls. Bolt his goyf. It dies. The souls token lives because it just got plus one plus one. The next turn, so he, he, he plays another Goyf, attacks again, uh, like the next turn when he can attack with his Goyf, he attacks. I block with a Spirit, I put Lightning Bolt on the stack, and he concedes the match. Wow. The, the, deck is, uh, the deck is ridiculous, it has lots of really cool, fun plays, but it also does things like go 0-4 in the Legacy Daily, like every other time that I play it. That is actually a pretty insane play, I gotta say. Yeah, I played against uh, Cloud Post, where the guy had six Cloud Posts in play. And I had opposition out, and uh, the fact that you can't just be like opposition those seven things when you're on Magic Online makes opposition a really hard card to play. But he eventually he ended up where I was tapping down like six lands a turn, and he was just like, "Oh, you tap down six lands, uh, Emrakul anyway." Oops, goodbye. Yeah, that deck can produce lots and lots of. Yes, yes, it can. Unfortunately, I have nothing else to say, and I have to go. All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody for listening. Um, we will be back. Good to be back. Probably next week to talk about. Any changes that happen to the banner restricted list, the, literally the day after we recorded this episode. Well, actually, the evening it comes out. Like <laughs> That's true, yes. Um, nine and a half hours from now. Hope everybody had a uh, good New Year, good Christmas. Have we recorded since Thanksgiving? Yeah, we recorded in December. All right, so we only missed the, the winter a holidays, month. the December holidays. Yeah. Hopefully everyone survived their final exam. I don't know anything about that. I am an adult. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Have fun, guys, and uh, now we're going to stop recording. <laughs> Feedback is always appreciated. Email us at everydayeternalcast at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash everydayeternalpodcast. Or follow us on Twitter at eternalmph.